for those who may not be as familiar, um, CRISPR uh, or the technology that we use for CRISPR was just recently uh, awarded for a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Jennifer Daunia and uh, Emmanuel Charpentier. Um, so often dubbed genetic scissors, but it's a, a, a mechanism, a means by which to be able to edit our genomes and edit any genome really, right? So this is, uh, you know, a technology that can be applied to plants and to animals and, and human beings and to cells in a dish, right? So there are all kinds of applications. Um, just to, to be clear, if, if we want to talk about this as genetic engineering or genetic genome editing, uh, th that concept and the technologies for that concept um, are, are not new, right? What makes this so impressive is that it is probably the most accurate methodology that can be done very, very cheaply and quite easily, right? So it's almost, it's the democratization of genome editing, if you will, that just makes this such a buzz, um, both for good and bad things. Malaria, uh, sorry, sickle cell disease, um, could likely be cured because of the advent of CRISPR-Cas9 technology. A um, couple of people have gone through clinical trials. It's been more than a year. They are in remission, no uh, untoward effects. Uh, incredibly exciting. This is a crippling, devastating disease in sub-Saharan Africa and a lot of places in South America. Um, to be on the brink of being able to eradicate sickle cell disease, um, I'm, it's hard to contain myself every time I think about it, right? But then at the same time, we have the case in China, right, with the generation of what are, you know, is being dubbed CRISPR babies, right? Um, and they, they've been, it, it's germline or embryo editing that then went on to create human beings, right, that are now uh, living and being monitored in China. Um, extraordinarily dangerous uh, because as accurate as this methodology is, we have not worked out all the kinks of the kinds of off-target effects that could occur, first of all, right? So um, the, the, the uh, region of the genome that was chosen to edit is not actually medically, uh, um, there's no consensus that that would really even be a, a good thing to do. Um, and third, we don't even have legal and ethical frameworks in place for how to think about editing of individuals such that those changes then get carried on from generation to generation, right? We have some legal framework for parents making decisions for their children, but not for their descendants, you know, four generations later. We don't even have a legal framework for this, right? So even within the scientific community, much less ethical. Right? So even within the scientific community, there's a whole lot of let's pump the brakes and before we start talking about germline editing, so that means sperm or egg or embryo so that it can become uh, a human being, before we start doing that, we really need to be thinking carefully about um, all of these kinds of legal, ethical and scientific issues that still need to be worked out. Right? Um, which is why I think that it's really important that we have people with holistic spiritual perspectives at the table in helping make these kinds of decisions. Right? But at the same time, as far as a technology for use in a research lab to be able to study the functions of different parts of the genome, we do that routinely and now can do it much more accurately and cheaply. So I'm a big fan of it. It just depends, you know, when people often ask me, is this technology evil? Is it bad? Is it good? And I usually say, it's not the technology that's ever bad or good, it's, it's how and why we are using that technology. And I think that's where we need to be cautious. There are certain applications, this is a, a lifesaver and a healer. And there are other applications where we need to pump the brakes and think really carefully.